1140 The Fan. Here we go again. It's Talking Money with Jeff Tarbell. Yep, yep. Uh, off the text line, a lot of questions on the text line today. Thank you very much. 441140 if you want to text me. 339 if you want to call me. Jeff at jefftarbell.com if you want to email me. If you want to cut my grass, my address is... For, I don't know, <laughs> my grass isn't growing. Um, where's the 831 area code? That almost sounds like... Uh, Somewhere out of this area, uh, my wife's mother, my wife's mother, your mother-in-law, passed away four months ago. No will. We're still making house payment. Her house payment. Her brother and sister want to purchase the home. The home is upside down. All payments are current. Okay, so, so they're looking to maybe buy it at a discount. Well, so here's two. I'm going to assume that there is not a reverse mortgage on it for one. If there's a reverse mortgage on a property, which you're going to see more and more now, the bank that holds the reverse mortgage will accept, typically, 95% of the market value, not what you owe. You can have it appraised. You can submit the appraisal to the bank, and they'll take 95% of whatever the appraisal is. So you're getting it you know, basically at market. Right. Minus realtor fees. Minus, right. right. And, and the bank's getting what they would get if, you know, if they put it on the market and sold it. So that makes sense. But this is probably not a reverse because they didn't say it was a reverse. Um, you got a couple issues here. Mom passed away without a will. So there's some kind of a probate that's got to go on. And that can take a little bit of time. And sometimes it can take a lot of time. And then do you really want to buy a house that is upside down? You know, well, I, mean, well, I think the thought would be is if, even though it's upside down, they'd like to buy it at market value or below because it must have some sentimental value. Right. That's the only reason you would do that is, is there some sentimental value to the home or it's a unique type property, right? It's a place on the coast or something you say, we want this place no matter what. So you, you've got to resolve the, the intestate, which means the, the, the you know, person passed away with no will. You've got to resolve that issue first because you've got to be able to get clear title to the property from mom. And then you got to approach the bank and say, okay, guys, we've been making the payments. Mom's not here anymore. They could call the note due, which is what would happen because the primary borrower is not on there anymore. And you could try to negotiate some type of a short sale to a relative. And that, as long as you're upfront about that and the bank knows what's going on, they'll, they'll, discuss, they'll have that discussion with you. I'm just not sure how you get clear title to the property yet until it goes through the, through, through the, um, through the, you know, the process of the state of California. Probate, right. Yeah. The, thank you. Probate process. So, you better ask that question to somebody first is, you know, get that process going and get the title cleared. So, so one of you, one of the heirs has the right to be able to transfer that property. Otherwise, you're better off to just let it go to the bank, let them foreclose on it. The bank will take title to it. Then you can call them up and say, hey, we want it. Because if they foreclose on it, then the title reverts to the bank. You don't have any probate issues, right? So there's a, there, that's, a, that's not as easy as it sounds, but you need to start asking some questions about what's going on there. Um Okay, this goes into the discussion we were having earlier for tax purposes. Jeff, I received a notice for tax purposes on a home I lost last year, 2011. The bank form says that if the loan amount is lower than the market value, I don't have to report anything. So you didn't get a... So if you owe less than the house is worth, which basically means there was some equity in there, if they foreclose on you and there's equity in the property, you didn't have a debt forgiveness, theoretically, I guess, according to this form, a debt forgiveness issue. If the bank foreclosed on your house and you were upside down by fifty grand, you know you walked away from fifty thousand dollars in debt, and there could be an issue. And this is very complex because there's there's some confusion out there. And I highly highly suggest that for this particular purpose, you speak with a CPA or a real estate attorney because my understanding is that you can avoid paying the tax debt up to the limit that you paid for the house. Okay. So let's let's talk about this for a minute. Nick buys his house for 150 grand back in the 80s. Okay, the house goes up to 350 grand in value, and Nick refinances his house and takes out a 300 thousand dollar loan and goes out and buys a Porsche and a boat, a new girlfriend, all these things. Okay, so now Nick owes 300 grand on a house that he bought for 150. 
he loses it with a two hundred seventy five thousand dollar note on it. Okay, so you are only able so that you know, you've you've taken out equity beyond what you paid for the house. My understanding is that there could still be some tax implication for that amount above what you paid for the house. Now, if you took out a line of credit or a loan and you put in a new pool, you put on a new roof, you added onto the house, all the money went into the house. Then your cost basis came up and you may not have an issue. But I, I think that there is still some issue out there. And that's why I say start this planning in January or February, please. Not November or December, because you may find out that you go through the whole short sale process and you still owe some tax or a lot of tax. And now that gun at your head looks worse. <laughs> the, the IRS gun looks worse than the gun of being upside down. Right. So know what you're getting into and know what you're, you're facing so that you don't make a bad decision. We've already all collectively made a crap load of bad decisions over the last five years, myself included. I'll put myself on top. I've, I've done a bunch of stuff I wish I hadn't done. But that decision has been made. I don't want to make any more. Ask the question. You know, don't just assume that you can walk away from your house and not have any tax bill. Get professional. Spend 250 bucks, please, for an hour. Whatever the guy charges you or person charges you, figure it out. Let's get to uh, line one. Alfie, welcome to Talking Money. What's happening? Hey, how are you? Good. Hey, I love the show. Hey, my question is, is um, I worked for a company for a long time, and we worked out of town a lot. And now they're kind of slow, so another company picked me up out of Portland, Oregon. And the company I worked for before always housed us, and we, they gave us a PTM and all that. But now with this new company, I've been staying in a hotel, paying my own you know, wage for the week and all that. Right. Is that a tax write-off? I'm not really sure because we're ready to do our taxes. And, you know, it's $1,000 a month to stay in a hotel, and I've been there for three months now. Absolutely. It's a, it's a, it's a write-off. It's called 2106 expense, unreimbursed business expense. 2106? Yes. The and, form. Yeah, the form is the 2106 form. It's called unreimbursed business expense. Now, let me caution you that that is probably one of the biggest line items that the IRS looks for in, uh -huh. fr in fraud. And so you better be able to back it up in terms of having receipts or, or even credit card receipts. Okay, as yeah, a business. which I do. Okay. Now, part B of that is this. When it comes to financing something down the road, if you're going to be looking to buy a house or a car or refinance or do those kind of things, uh -huh. that most people, when they, they call me up and they say, hey, Jeff, I make 60000 a year. You know, I travel around the country. I make $60,000 a year in my job. And so we pre-qualify somebody based on sixty grand a year. And then I get their tax returns, and they have these 20, 2106 expenses in there for 14000 for the year. We have to deduct that from your income because we assume... It's a legitimate expense. You didn't get reimbursed for it, and so your net income is what we're going to use. So you do have to be aware that the good news is you don't have to pay tax on that income. The bad news is it, it does kind of shoot you down for future for qualifying a little bit. So be be aware of both the pluses and minuses of doing that. Okay. Well, this new, the second question is, so the company for now is in Oregon, and they don't have state taxes, and I, and, but we're working here in Northern California. So what would I do for that? Are they going to send me a, a W-2 form? They're supposed to send it this weekend. But I'm not really sure. Yeah, how does that works. Since they're going, they're going to. Well, they're always going to send you a W two because the W two is the IRS. Correct. So you, you're a California resident living in California, making your money, you know, bringing your money back here. You're going to pay state tax, uh, is my understanding. Now, maybe you might talk to a CPA if if I if I spend 25 percent of my time in Oregon, working in Oregon at the at the facility there. You know, can I pull that income out? You know, kind of like kind of like how the NBA works a little bit, where they travel around. And, and the individual states can build an NBA player for playing in my arena here. In, in some states, they don't. So yeah. that's a good question. That's, that's, that's not a probably an H&R Block fill online computer form question. You're probably going to have to ask somebody, you know, can I pull some of my income out? If you are, in fact, can prove, you know, you were working and maybe residing in Oregon at the ho in the hotel rooms during those periods. You know, so there's a little bit of work that has to be done there, Alfie. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, and enjoy the show. Yep, yep. Thank you. I'll hear you on next Saturday. All right. Sounds good. Bye. Oh, by the way, we did get a winner to our quiz question on who the stock market wants to win. Uh, Hector got it right, and it was the New York football giants. They are one of the original NFL teams. It probably doesn't, doesn't hurt that the, the stock market, Wall Street's on New York, so they really want them to, to win. So we got that right as well. We got time for one more quiz question here? Yeah. Last break. Oh, we're, running out of, we're running out of time. You know, we almost need to do two hours. I, I got one here. I got this off the, uh, off the line here. Okay. Um, here's a question for you. Preliminary bidding for the sale of Los Angeles Dodgers has been completed, right? According to the LA Times, at least eight groups from early bidders have advanced. How about just giving us a name of one? One of the bidders that has advanced in the bid for buying the Los Angeles Dodgers. One of the individuals? Well, 
Actually, let me put it this way. Give me the, the I'll, I'll, I'm going to tighten this up a little bit. Give me the name of the ex-professional basketball player that has advanced in that group of eight. Spud Webb. Nope. Damn. What are we giving away, Jeff? I don't know. It's your quiz Still question. Still got some more of that? <laughs> we got some Sierra Tahoe ski passes. It Ooh, is snowing up there nice. in Sierra Tahoe. We've got some IMAX gift certificates to uh, catch a movie at IMAX. We've got some Cupcake Craving. We've got some Gym Boys. Or Nick will come to your house and paint your front wall. All right. This is three. Th- this is 339. This is Talking Money. 339-1140. 1-800-920-1140. And I did get an interesting uh, email last week. Jeff, do you hate Obama? I'll answer that when we come back. 